It's a sleepy, struggling little town about 70 miles from the Canadian border. It sits on the Fort Peck Indian Reservation in northeast Montana. And like so many communities in the state, the mighty railroad runs right through it. Poplar, Montana. Population, about 800. You know, the kind of place where just about everyone knows something about everybody else. And just about everyone knew this young woman. Kimberly Ann Niece, a pretty girl getting ready to turn 18. In 1979, she was the valedictorian of her graduating class at Poplar High. Family members say she had some big plans. Seems she wanted to spread her wings and fly to Missoula to attend the University of Montana. Her aunt is Cindy Smith. She'd tell it like it was. She was um, valedictorian of her high school class. She could party with the best of them and still, still maintain and do what she needed to do to be successful. She had success written all over her. But just weeks after graduating, Kim's summer, her future success, and her young life would come to a brutal and tragic end. It happened here, in this open field, shaded by a few trees near the Poplar River and less than a hundred yards from Highway 2. It was in the early morning hours of June 16, 1979. Kim had been driving her daddy's pickup truck that night. And investigators say it was inside that truck where she was viciously beaten with a crescent wrench and possibly other tools before being dragged out of the truck on the passenger side and beaten more until she breathed no more. There was no sexual assault, robbery, not a motive. Investigators say whoever took this young woman's life did so with vengeance and extreme anger. Kim's blood and hair were just about everywhere inside the cab of that truck. Outside, a pool of blood and clumps of Kim's hair where the final blows were delivered. She was hit in the head and neck dozens of times. Autopsy said her skull was completely crushed. Her lifeless, bloody body was then dragged 257 feet and rolled off this cliff along the Poplar River just underneath the train bridge, a popular hangout for kids in the area. Her attacker, or attackers, then crawled down to the riverbank and pushed her body into the water. Tomorrow, the clues left behind, including three sets of footprints along the drag trail a bloody handprint on the passenger side of the pickup, more than two dozen fingerprints, and a rather chilling early morning phone call. I'm the guy that got the phone call at five in the morning, two hours before, so supposedly before they found the body, and everything started rocking and rolling. a winding area of the Poplar River where a sandbar juts out. It's called Sandy Beach. This is where Barry Beach says he was partying with two friends the afternoon before Kim Neese was killed. Beach says it was late in the afternoon when he tried to leave the area, but says his car was stuck in the sand, and in his effort to drive it out, says he blew the transmission. Beach told Montana authorities investigating Kim Neese's death that he started walking home and caught a ride along the way with a couple of friends. Beach lived in this neighborhood with his mother and stepdad, in fact, on the same side of the street as Kim, who lived just a few doors down in this hall. Both had lived in the neighborhood since they were small children, and in fact, back in the day, they played together with the other kids on the block. Beach says when he got home around 5.30 or 6 o'clock on the evening of June 15, 1979, no one was in the house. So he says he got something to eat, went upstairs after having partied for two straight days, climbed into bed and says, he slept until the next morning. In fact, he told authorities he didn't find out about Kim's death until much later in the day while branding cattle on his uncle's farm. Now, in the confession that he gave to Louisiana authorities, his story took a wicked turn. Beach says he actually woke up a few hours after he went home and decided to go back out. It was Friday night, school out for the summer. He says he walked down the main drag of Poplar where he saw Kim Neese sitting alone in her daddy's pickup truck at this now burned down Exxon gas station. 
Beach says it was late at night, and others in town said the same. They saw Kim sitting alone in the pickup truck at the gas station at about 12.30 in the morning. Beach says they talked. He got in her truck, and they drove around for a while, ending up near the Poplar River where he says they parked. Beach says the two smoked some marijuana, a couple of joints, and after talking about their plans for the summer, he says he tried to kiss her. She refused and slapped him. Says he tried repeatedly until she ordered him out of the truck. Beach says he eventually became angry, and after having been slapped a second time, he punched her. Says Kim fought back. During the fight, he says he saw a crescent wrench on the floor of the truck, grabbed it, and began hitting her with it. Beach says Kim managed to open the driver's side door and get out, so he jumped out of the passenger side, ran around the pickup truck, and pushed her up against the vehicle and began choking her and says he tried to kiss her again. Says when he saw a tire iron in the bed of the truck, he grabbed it and started beating her with it. She ran, he chased her, tackled her, and beat her until she was dead. Beach says he got scared, found a plastic garbage bag in the truck, pulled it up over Kim Nee's feet toward her neck, and dragged her from underneath her arms down to the Papa River where he dumped her body and eventually threw the murder weapons and the keys to her truck. Beach says he started running for home. He stopped along the way, he says, to burn his blood-stained clothes inside a train boxcar. He says when he got home, he went upstairs, washed the blood off of his body, discarded those materials, and says he got into bed and tried to convince himself he didn't do it. That's the confession he gave to Louisiana authorities in January of 1983. In your confession, you said you went home, you washed up, and you went to bed trying to convince yourself that you didn't kill her. Is it possible you spent your entire life trying to convince yourself you didn't do it? Small towns and rumors, they pretty much go together like that, don't they? And when Kim Knees was killed and no one was immediately arrested, oh, there was hush talk in Poplar, Montana. In fact, most of those whispers suggested three girls were responsible for killing Kim. Seems Kim had gone out with a boy the night before who was the father of the child of one of those three girls. Police said they investigated. No one was arrested. But decades later, during a 2011 hearing ordered by the state Supreme Court to determine if the man convicted of killing Kim Neese deserved a new trial, something seemingly extraordinary happened. This woman, Steffi Eagleboy, told Judge E. Wayne Phillips she had spent a lifetime holding tightly onto a secret from the time she was 10 years old. Steffi says the night Kim Neese was murdered, she and her cousin were sitting near this rock on the hill that overlooks the area where Kim breathed her last breath. What did you hear that night? Screaming, yelling around. What kind of screaming? I don't know, like somebody getting beat up or fighting or... What was being said, anything? Just somebody chasing another, I mean, girls chasing another girl, telling them to get her. And I mean, you know, the other girl running, crying, saying, help me. And it's, it's just something you can't forget. After you heard this, what did you see? Well, after we heard everything, we sat here and then we seen a cop car coming down from the road right here. And how I knew it was a cop car because it had its lights on. On top? Yeah, had the lights on on top. Then it came down the road. Then when it got to the two vehicles parked over this way, then it shut its lights off. Now, after you've put two and two together over a period of time, you recognize, in your mind anyway, that Kim Knees was killed by a group of girls. Yes? Mm-hmm. Why didn't you tell anybody? Because I couldn't trust anybody. Everybody keeps asking me that. Why can't you say why didn't you say anything? Because I don't trust anybody. I don't trust nobody. I didn't trust law enforcement then. Well, if your version of what happened is true. There's an innocent guy sitting in prison. Yes, there is. And it is true. Those girls are the ones that did it, not Barry. And I know that because I heard it. 
Barry didn't do it. Those girls did it. A tightly held secret out of fear of law enforcement, and she says, a fear of those girls. Do you feel like a burden has been lifted now that you've been able to at least say what you heard that night? Yeah, I felt a relief, a big relief, but it's not over yet until he gets out. Then I'll feel a lot more better. Judge Phillips cited Steffi's testimony as a major reason for his decision to order a new trial for Barry Beach. He also freed Beach on his own recognizance. Beach came to Billings, where he lived and worked in construction for 18 months. But the state Supreme Court, the same court that appointed Judge Phillips, overturned his decision following an appeal by the Attorney General's office. And Beach was returned to prison, where he sits today. There are some very high-profile supporters calling for Beach's release, including U.S. Senator John Tester, former Montana Governor Brian Schweitzer, former U.S. Senator Conrad Burns, and former Lieutenant Governor John Bollinger. So, who killed Kim Neese? At the end of the day, it will very likely turn out only the killer and Kim will know the truth, and the rumors in Poplar, well, they will never be hushed.